Now please join me in welcoming to the stage our esteemed speakers, Sara Sabri, first Arab and African female citizen astronaut, Dr. Usama Khatib, deep sea robotic explorer, and Suad Al Harthi, National Geographic explorer. promises to be both compelling and thought-provoking with the name from deep space to deep ocean a future of exploration and discovery we'll explore the depth of human ingenuity the role of Arab talent and the exciting future of exploration to start I'd like to invite with no specific order each speaker to give me two to three minutes of their time to tell me about their role um, so I'll start with you please sure thank you uh, so, um, as a National Geographic Explorer, we try to push the boundaries of science, technology, innovation, storytelling uh, for the society's mission of advancing and illuminating, as well as protecting the nature of our world. As the executive director of Amman's only environmental NGO, the Environment Society of Amman, that um, ha goes hand in hand with my work as a National Geographic Ex Explorer. So what we try to do is work on conservation of Amman's natural heritage, and we do this specifically by conducting scientific research with the purpose of advancing uh, conservation science, advocating for conservation policies, and then also working on community engagement initiatives and programs um, in the target area. So depending on what the science is telling you, for example, if we are studying and researching whales or sea turtles, working with the local communities in the area that's adjacent to those areas to elevate um, environmental awareness. Uh, we also work with schools uh, to promote greening education, environmental education, promoting the next generation of environmental stewards. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Osama? Yes. Well, uh, as a professor of uh, computer science at Stanford University, I'm involved in robotic research. And uh, robotics is, uh, at this uh, time, uh, is, is becoming uh, something that is touching uh, humans in ways that we have never imagined. Robotics was uh, mostly in manufacturing. And now robots are coming to homes, to uh, hospitals. Uh, we have thousands of uh, procedures performed by robots today. But there are also the environment uh, aspect of uh, applying robotics where, uh, for instance, in oceans. Uh, this is an area where uh, already we have robots that are providing um, information, uh, visual information about uh, the ocean inspection of uh, sites, human build, but uh, we still don't have the capability of reaching and operating and working underwater. Uh, and this is something that uh, we are working on, and uh, uh, believe me, it's a lot of fun. Sada? Um, first of all, thank you so much for having us here, and I'm really excited to be here for the Dubai Future Forum. So I think that's a really, really good platform for us to be talking about the future of humanity and the world and UAE, I think, is doing an incredible job at really trying to push for collaboration between the whole world. And I think, how, for me, I'm uh, half Egyptian, half Lebanese. I grew up in Egypt, was born in Saudi, actually, and uh, studied mechanical engineering, um, worked in robotic surgery for a little bit and stem cells for a little bit, uh, did my master's in biomedical engineering, and I'm currently doing my PhD in aerospace, where we work on space suits and also uh, do a lot towards space policy and law. So there's a lot of things that, you know, when we talk about pushing humanity forward, there's a lot of discussions about how do we do that actually in, practi in practice? How do we help modify those laws that, you know, allow for this collaboration that benefits both parties or like all parties when we're talking about it? And actually, when it comes to conservation, um, I don't think we talked about that, but I did marine conservation Amazing. and uh, worked in that a little bit. So it's um, oceans are a great, great passion of mine too as well. And I think when you go to space, oh, I forgot to mention too that I did want to go to space two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> forgot to mention the most important part that you went to space. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple years ago, I got selected. And um, by the first program, that's not government-based. 
um, because I'm from Egypt, I can't apply to any program that exists in the world except for this one, um, because uh, each country selects astronauts based on like their citizens, which makes perfect sense. So this program was very new, and uh, they select astronauts based on different either criteria, and I got selected two years ago. Um, I became their second citizen astronaut, so there's only two of us in the world and uh, got selected out of over 4,000 applicants, got sent to space two years ago, um, was training for a year and a half prior, and I'm continuing my training too again, so my plan is to definitely go back. Um, my research has always been, um, not always, but after my master's has been very heavily focused on space, still continuing my research, still want to uh, help with that and also help uh, build the ecosystem around Africa and the Middle East, trying to do a lot more there. Um, I'm also founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Deep Space Initiative, where we do exactly that. We're trying to enable deep space exploration by making it accessible for everyone. So we provide opportunities in research and education and work on the legal side. We have about 300 members, 47 projects, and 60 nationalities, which is pretty, pretty diverse. So yeah. It's quite an inspirational thing, honestly, being moderating a panel with two successful women, not forgetting you, Professor Osama, and a successful man. <laughs> but it's quite nice when the tables are sometimes turned because it's always, you know, I love, this is something that I really appreciate about the UAE, the GCC, Dubai Future Forum, uh, sorry, Dubai Future Foundation, focusing on female talent as well. And as the first Egyptian astronaut and the first Arab and African woman in space, what was the moment that made you realize you could achieve this incredible feat? And what mo motivated you to pursue this path? Because we were speaking in the room and I was saying, and I'm sorry if I'm, I sound quite backwards here. Um, so Sarah's always been based in Egypt and it's quite rare to hear that an astronaut came out of the Arab world. And I wanna know what drove you to this path? That's actually a really good question. I think it does make sense to, to, to think that way because it's true. Like I think because of the opportunities that are not there and because of how we always tend to, and I think we always tend to kind of like try to focus on the problems that are around us and not really look, look too forward too much in the, in the future because there's so much going on right now. So I think some of the reasons for why that is is because everyone around you tries to tell you not to do it. For me, when I was growing up, I, I was always asked, like, why can't I be normal? Like, why, why are you dreaming about things that, that are just not possible? Just, like, be normal, just, like... So I think in our communities, and even if it's with good intentions, and I don't think it's, like, from... Like, it's not coming from a bad place. It's just from fear of doing something that's just hasn't been done before. So you have a lot of fear and a lot of resistance that comes with that. And I think doing it, even though it was incredibly difficult and the possibility of it happening was almost, not almost, was zero. So it wasn't for this program and like I think with the commercial industry and with more and more programs, like the UAE has a space program, it has a human space flight program, uh, Saudi has a human space flight program, so now we have two Saudi astronauts, we have four UAE astronauts. So there's some of, few of us now on the Arab world, which when I was growing up, that, was, that wasn't even something we can imagine. So I think a lot of you, in this room, would you have ever imagined for us in the Arab world to have three female astronauts, three Arab astronauts, two that have flown and one that Nora has not flown yet, but she's, she's an incredible, incredible woman too. Um, so I think we are heading towards that and by representation, by, like, by showing that it is possible, we will be receiving less and less of that negative, you know, just uh, being pulled back into, being told to be more realistic, being told that you wouldn't amount to anything. Um, I was told that mechatronics would be too difficult for me. I was told that I wouldn't have any opportunities in my country if I wanted to do biomedical engineering. And I was told that I was wasting my time being interested in the space field. But I think you have to really believe in why you're doing what you're doing. For me, it was always about we, as human beings, this is just the natural trajectory of where we're going. We have to be exploring space. We have to be understanding ourselves a little bit more. We have to be doing that for all of humanity together and not just, you know, 
focusing on the, the things that have been done before. Definitely, it's good to focus on all of these things. And we have so many different people doing all of the things at the same time, right? So we shouldn't be stopping those who are trying to do the things that are not being done, because otherwise, we wouldn't get to anywhere. We wouldn't really progress. So I think a big part of it is representation that's going to be changing things, hopefully. Um, for me, it was just trusting my instinct and really believing that that was the right thing to do. I want to touch base on opportunity, and I want to go to Suad. Suad is an Emirati woman, and she works in Oman as well. I want to know about opportunity. What, how did the UAE and Oman offer this opportunity for you to explore? You, work, uh, you told me you work in um, ocean exploration as well, which is such an interesting field. We have such intelligent robotic explorer, space explorer, ocean explorer. So can you tell me about the opportunities that were handed to you and how the challenges that came on the way as well? Uh, yeah, I would say that in terms of opportunity uh, as an Emirati, as many people here know, uh, education is very important and um, being given the opportunity to be fully funded for both my bachelor's as well as uh, master's program studying environmental sciences and then pursuing coastal environmental management. Uh, I didn't feel limited in terms of the topics that I selected and you know the ability to to actually go and pursue that and then come back to my country. And uh, initially I worked for the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi. And coming back there, uh, I would say quite similar to Sara, even though you are a field scientist and uh, you, know, you have this passion for adventure, the outdoors and curiosity about the natural world, initially the expectation is that as a female, you would stay in the office and there was not an expectation that you would go out into the field. And I needed to break that barrier uh, somewhat with my male colleagues, as well as with my parents, because it's not really um, considered the norm for a female to go out at that time, 20 years ago, uh, and be out on you know, expeditions where you're sometimes the only female on an island. Um, what that taught me is just follow what you're passionate about, pursue it, conduct yourself respectfully, and in turn, your actions and your achievements uh, will showcase what you're really there for. Um, I had many opportunities to, you know, take courses and things like that, um, to be involved not only in um, being part of the field team, but also leading many of these expeditions. And similarly in Oman, um, you know, quite quickly I think that, you know, based on the work that you do, you can quickly move into leadership role by demonstrating your skills. And um, there's just uh, a plethora of marine and terrestrial wildlife that is yet to be uncovered and discovered and you know it feels really great to be at the forefront leading some of the work there in this in this field yeah um professor osama i want to know firstly what you think about this entire females becoming deep explorers and deep sea you're you're a deep sea explorer as well yourself you work in robotics with deep sea exploration I want to know what you feel when you walk into a classroom and you find more females than males in your class. <laughs> well, um, gender equality is uh, a very important uh, aspect of uh, uh, what we strive uh, about in, uh, uh, at least in, in the West. We, we, uh, we are always uh, promoting uh, this equality and uh, it is succeeding to some extent. However, uh, I've been quite impressed with the uh, Emirates uh, representation in different university I visited, uh, where uh, the percentage of female is even bigger, larger than uh, what we have in the West, although it's not in the same uh, areas. Now, going to uh, our field, uh, it's very interesting to see a large representation of female in our field, in robotics. And uh, because robotics really touches the human, there are aspects of uh, the work that connect with biomechanics, uh, human motion. Um, we, uh, we look at sport and uh, performance and uh, injury and uh, medical applications. And we have a lot of interest uh, by uh, female students who are pursuing that work. Uh, in my own lab, in my uh, own expeditions, uh, this rep representation is quite high. In fact, uh, 
we, uh, we have uh, almost 50% of our team to be uh, involved with, uh, with the research or in uh, field e expeditions uh, related to uh, the, the uh, work that we are doing in robotics. Uh, still, we need much more and uh, I'm really proud to be between you two uh, 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 role models uh, for what we would like to see in the future. And I know that you work in robotics. We're just going to go a little bit technical now, um, particularly in deep sea exploration, just like I said. How do you see robotics as a bridge between the exploration of space and the exploration of the Earth's ocean? What lessons do we learn from one that can inform the other? Yes, uh, by the way, uh, we already placed um, part of the devices that we are using in underwater in space. And uh, with the European Space Agency, we have a plan to connect space to the ocean. So who knows, maybe Sarah will be uh, operating my robots from space. <laughs> so uh, robotics is uh, really exciting today because uh, it is really going to, to the real world. Uh, before robotics was confined to a structured manufacturing environment, and now we are talking about taking robotics to uh, extreme environment, dangerous environment for a human, or intervening in environment where a human cannot be, like, like the oceans. The example of the oceans is very interesting because uh, a human can dive for comf comfortably for 60 meters, but the ocean's uh, average are thousands of meters. And Still, we, we probably uh, know more about uh, extraterrestrial planets than about our oceans. Our oceans are life for the planet. And uh, I really think this is the, the questions we, we are uh, addressing today. I mean, it, it relates to the environment, to sustainability, to, to the life of the ocean, because it is really the life of the planet. And uh, uh, what I'm really uh, excited about is the fact that technology today is bringing tools that we never had before. Uh, the ability to touch and operate and uh, intervene, not only observe, but intervene uh, at thousands of meters of depth uh, is something that wasn't there before and I think it's going to, to change the way we interact in the oceans. Every time someone says something along the lines of, it wasn't there before, I can't help but think about accessibility and someone behind working so hard to make everything like this accessible. Sara, you've been dedicated to democrati sorry, democratizing access to space research and education through your work with Deep Sea Initiative. How do you envision making space more accessible to young people in the air world and beyond? So there's a few things that we've been able to do so far. So a Deep Space Initiative is a US nonprofit. Founded, uh, I founded it in 2021. And throughout the years, I think we've learned a lot about the demand. I think that's one thing, like, do we have people in the region that are interested in it? And the answer to that is yes, so many. And I think every year we open up research programs and we get just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applicants and we have more and more from this region. And the thing for me, when I was first started getting interested in the space field, it was just completely inaccessible. Um, I wanted to do research in space, but even, even though I, I would qualify that I had the experience, that I had everything that was written in the criteria of what they needed in a researcher, I couldn't apply because I didn't have the US passport, for example, or a European passport. So um, your passport does sometimes dictate what you can and cannot do, which does not make sense at all. And I think what we've been trying to do with DSI is really kind of like challenge that a little bit, where it is a US nonprofit, but we do have researchers from 60 different countries. And they have been able to work together to produce incredible, incredible work. We have topics that range from astronaut health and performance, um, pharmaceuticals, um, in-space manufacturing, in-situ uh, in resource utilization, space transportation systems. 
we have people working on rovers for Mars, we have people working on bioreactors, we have wor people working on so many different ranges of topics, and they're being mentored and supervised by people who are completely donating their time from, from NASA, from Blue Origin, from Ukraine Space Agency, from Indian Space Agency. We have people from all over the world, and it's a really like, incredible to see the, the power of having such a diverse network of people doing actual real work that is benefiting the field because how we've designed these programs it's basically like how you would how would you would have an institution in academia so you go through the whole program you get also like some requirements to take some of our courses or stuff like that and then you're mentored supervised the the end goal is for you to have a publication or go present at the conference so either peer review journal or by our own review boards and then they actually can work in this. The next steps for us is how do we bring this to life? So I think that's kind of like the next step here. They are working on research, but they, we don't want them to leave their countries because we keep seeing that again and again and again. And a lot of us have had to leave our countries to be able to have those opportunities or to be able to create those opportunities. I went and did my master's elsewhere because it wasn't available in my country. It just did not exist. Um, I'm doing now my PhD somewhere else other than my country because, again, it just does not exist in my country. So I think it's not by choice that we leave our countries, but I think it's also really important and it's a huge responsibility for us to make sure that at least those that are coming, those that are still younger now and working on it, they don't have to leave because if we keep doing that, then we're really, brain drainage is always a huge issue. So what we're trying to do with DSI is we create this IP, we wanna give it back to the researchers in their own countries, help them get the funding, commercialize some of these projects and build the ecosystem for those projects in wherever they're from. So I think this is the next phase for us and it's like the next five year plan for us is to move from this academic, um, more research oriented um, like way of doing things which is incredibly important and I mean, like this is how we get things moving, this is how we do things, this is how we change things. Now we need to go into commercialization. How do we bring in investors in Africa or in the Middle East to create these st startups, to help them do things, to, have, to be able to be part of the field, let's say like when we're building the next space station, we're building modules. Um, there aren't many startups in the space field, or actually there are none from Africa. In the Middle East, I'm not sure, but also there are, if none, if not, like maybe, I don't know exactly, I, I, I can't really say the statement for, for a fact, I don't know of any space startups in the Middle East. There might be, but I just, I'm not aware of them. I know that in Africa, there, there probably is none either. So what we're trying to do is, we want to have, give them this agency and this possibility to be able to do it. And we can do it from within. We shouldn't be, and a lot of things that I have learned since coming back from space, so since, you know, because everything that I had done before has always been engineering, and that's kind of like what I wanted to do. You know, engineering is easy at the end of the day. It's, you can have these solutions to problems. You can have elegant or non-elegant solutions. But then, how do you put it actually in the real world? And that's where I found really challenging, and that's why I've been doing a lot of things also related to policy and law, and understanding like what are the restrictions legally for, people, for countries to be collaborating. There's definitely, I think, yesterday we were sitting on a round table, and um, I think um, one of the ministers was talking about how like, it's always about national interest. Yes, for sure, we need to definitely be taking into that into account. But also there is like the humanities interest here too, that I think we need to be taking that into account as well. We need to be trying to think a little bit outside the box on how to collaborate more. And I think UAE is doing that. Yeah, and that's I what I wanted to touch base on. I think we're very lucky, maybe Saad and I, because we're from here. I'm born and raised here, so this is home for me. I think I'm extremely lucky for the UAE to create such an important, um, set the standards for other countries with space exploration, with any field that you think that you wanna study, I think the UAE has that field or is working on that field. And that's why I wanna go back to Saad being an Emirati and holding that responsibility. Um, you're a role model in environmental exploration and the environmental space. How do you encourage others, particularly in the, other, uh, in the Arab world and in the UAE, to take responsibility for the planet? I know the UAE is big 
on environment, sustainability. We hosted COP28 proudly, uh, but a lot of work is still made to be done. How do you set the stage for that? So I would say as role models, you know, I'm be, I am the first Emirati National Geographic Explorer, as an example. Uh, His Excellency Sultan al Niyadi, first uh, Emirati astronaut. I think what this helps with, it um, allows the youth to see a mirror rather than a window. So when you look at an explorer, it's a window. If that person doesn't reflect you know, your values, your morals, doesn't look like you, doesn't act like you, doesn't think like you, but then when you have mirrors, when you look at explorers, uh, you can see yourself being that individual. You can see yourself in that space. And uh, I think that that helps to change things. So as an example, as a child, I never would have imagined that uh, Emiratis could explore space. And now they're going even further and doing polar explorations as well. That's something completely unexpected. But then it changes um, the, the, the mindset of the youth and for, of the next generation because they believe that, oh, you know, it is attainable, it is within reach, and, you know, the sky's the limit or beyond, you know. Uh, in terms of preparing uh, the youth, I think that it is a mindset when we think of sustainability. It's your day-to-day -day actions um, that make an impact and it starts at home. So we have a lot of programs that focus on um, school age children in particular because they have the capacity not only to make a difference within their school environment, we also promote them making a difference within their local community and working with their local communities to magnify their impact, working on uh, challenges, uh, presenting them with the challenges that we're currently facing. So when you look at biodiversity loss, climate change, these are big global issues, but what does it mean for me locally, you know? But having them understand that, no, these are not just global issues, they are local issues. You have the ability to impact and influence it, or you actually have the capacity to make a change, and we place that faith in you, you know? So you give them that opportunity and say, oh, why don't you have a look at your local environment? What are the environmental challenges? What can you do to make a difference to uh, minimize waste, uh, improve um, uh, pollution, uh, improve energy efficiencies, improve water efficiencies. And they're way more innovative than we are when you, when you actually give them the chance. So I would say that starting um, at the school level is very important. And then we, when we're looking at um, college and university students, early career individuals, it's also important to make them understand that our ambition is to move towards a sustainable future you are expected to be a part of that change, and any job of the future can be considered a green job. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a chef, uh, you think of sustainable food practices, and you know what are the carbon emissions re related to presenting a plate, where was the, was the fish caught? I mean, was it caught sustainably? Uh, similarly, if you're an architect, look at sustainable design. So I think it's important that these concepts get embedded in everything that we do if we want to see a sustainable future. Yeah, and you, ta you spoke about teaching as well. We have a teacher in the middle here. I'm curious to know the sense of responsibility that you feel. How do you foster a sense of responsibility in the next generation of innovators? And also, to be a teacher is to have a big sense of responsibility because I don't think anyone will ever forget their teachers. You hold a, a huge position in, a, in someone's life. So what's the responsibility that you feel to teach the next generation? Well, education is very important, and uh, we all know that. The, the, the problem is very often uh, we are maybe neglecting education at uh, early stages. I think this is one of the most important part in how we develop. Uh, basically, uh, kids who, who learn math early on, they, they become really good at math. And uh, if you start missing math and physics and science, then it is difficult to, to follow up with it. Now, as we move to research and uh, we move to uh, advances in technology and science, uh, 
we, 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 we have places around the world where uh, we have the laboratories, we have the equipment, we have everything that makes it uh, really uh, possible to pursue uh, these ambitious uh, research projects, which is not the case everywhere. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've been uh, doing at, uh, at Stanford was really to reach beyond Stanford. We developed a program called uh, uh, Stanford Everywhere. And in this program, which I participated in launching, uh, I have students everywhere. In China, in uh, India, in Egypt, in uh, Morocco, in all around the world, and also in the Emirates. And those programs uh, essentially started the concept of uh, online education. But online education is a complement, not the solution. And uh, what is really important in, in some of the fields like robotics is the, the actual uh, experimental work that requires equipment, that requires also uh, understanding the machines that we are working with. So we are developing uh, very advanced software systems that are controllable by interfaces that are quite affordable. So some of the interfaces would cost professionally like thousand, tenth of thousand of dollars, but uh, the ones that we are making available to students uh, around the world are much, much lower, like hundreds of dollars. So uh, there is something about technology and how we can use it in ways where uh, everyone can have access to this. Well, particularly for uh, the Emirate, uh, I've been uh, privileged to, to, to work here with the Fusion Foundation in robotics uh, across uh, Dubai in uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, in Sharjah, uh, participating in different programs. And I really uh, can say that I'm absolutely impressed by uh, the students and their thirst for knowledge and discovery, uh, which is uh, not surprising. Yeah. Uh, Saad, I actually want to ask you about technology and with the advancements in robotics and space technologies. How do you think we can integrate these innovations in conservative efforts as well? Yeah, actually, um, I was just speaking to Dr. Osama and, and saying with his technology, I, might, I may be soon out of a job. Um, but actually, um, looking at the technological side of things, humans have limits, as he's, as he's mentioned. So if you're going to be diving, there's only a specific depth that you're able to access. Uh, when I look at, for example, our uh, whale research, so we have an Arabian Sea humpback whale research program in Oman. We are limited by funding. We're limited by the number of uh, days that we can spend at sea. We're limited by weather condition because they also have the monsoon winds that come up in the summer months, which means you can't be at sea doing research during that period. Uh, but with technology such as uh, satellite telemetry, you can then put satellite tagging on some of your species. And as a result of that, you're able to gather information for an extended period uh, for locations that you may not be able to access. So it really can make a big difference. Similarly, when we look at deep sea exploration, there's still so much that remains unknown. I think I read something like 80%, if not more, of the oceans, uh, of the oceans remain unexplored by humans. So there's still so much out there. We don't know what uh, species are out there. Um, you know, biodiversity is very important for maintaining uh, human health, climate resilience, uh, supporting the clean air that we breathe, and uh, knowing more allows you to uh, conserve, understand what, what is out there, what needs to be conserved. And at the same time, when you look at um, our current ambitions towards net zero targets and minimizing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the oceans have a huge capacity to harness um, these greenhouse, gas, um, greenhouse gases, but uh, there's still technology that's unfolding on, you know, to what extent can we magnify that? To what extent can we speed this process up? So there's so many solutions that are yet to be uncovered through these uh, 
these kind of explorations. I, I'm curious because you, you said about there is so much still to uncover. What can the UAE, Oman, GCC do, or the Middle East do to be able to be ahead of the game in the, in the, in the region or in, in the world? How, what can countries, people, nations do to be the first? So building your human resource capacity is really important. Uh, so building that next generation, exposing the youth to curios curiosity, about exploration, about innovation, uh, building their critical thinking skills. These are things that are important. Um, and uh, at the same time, funding, financing for this is very important. Uh, I work for a very small nonprofit organization. One of the biggest challenges that we have is financing to support uh, these, uh, these programs, these initiatives. So, I think that there's definitely a des desire to diversify economies, to build economies, but it's important for us to realize that um, nature conservation and environmental sustainability needs to go hand in hand with that. And we need to start consider supporting and providing financing for businesses and initiatives that are sustainable. You said sparking curiosity. So wrapping this up, I would like each one of the speakers to give their opinion about it. So exploration often begins with curiosity, but it also comes with a heavy responsibility to ensure our discoveries are used wisely and safe and ethical. How can we spark curiosity in young people, especially here in the Arab world, but also making them understand that there's a big responsibility with curiosity and we need to be careful and ethical. So in no specific order, Sara, you can begin. It's a very difficult, difficult question. Um, I think that's like a very big challenge. How do we even do that for adults? Like honestly, because we do understand the technology is well heading in one way when you can look at it in a either like pessimistic way where you think, oh, it's gonna be the end of humanity or you can say that that's actually could be what's solving gonna be and definitely talking about AI, just like everyone else in the world. But like you can see also the benefits that could come from it. So it's, I think we as adults, a lot of us still don't understand the true impact that it could have. So I think it's really difficult to relay that message to younger generations right now. I think maybe focusing more on the curiosity part that it's just so big. There is so much out there. Maybe just like the, the idea that as maybe what you can do, and let's say, for example, in the space field, you could be an architect, you could be a designer, you could be a computer engineer, you could be any type of field that you, can, that you are already. It depends on your passion. Whatever makes you feel alive, then you follow that just because you love it, and then you will find something eventually. What do you think, Professor Osama? Well, uh, actually, you, you mentioned something about the ethical issues related to human and machines. And uh, while in manufacturing we replace workers, today uh, robots that are coming closer to human really needs uh, human support. These robots has merely functional autonomy, but they need the surgeon to operate. So we need the archaeologist to touch and feel before starting the operation. So don't worry. we. Robots will, will not replace human. Uh, they will extend the capabilities of human. They will let human reach beyond where human can go. Uh, another aspect of this is safety. And safety is a very, very important aspect of robotics. Today, we are able to create this interface between human and the machine. And this interface is allowing a surgeon to operate across the ocean. Now, this robot has to be 100% safe for the intervention. And uh, we are working on developing those safe machines with new technologies that are bringing touch-sensitive compliance, m material, new material, and uh, many of those things. Uh, but in addition, uh, there are many other aspects of uh, the use of technology, uh, especially digital technology and in the way it is used and how it's affecting society and what impact it's having. 
So this is probably a question we need to have a whole debate about. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Should have started with that question. <laughs> So in terms of harnessing curiosity, I would say that, um, you know, from the conservation side of things, exposure to nature is really important. So I would encourage the youth to spend more time outdoors in nature so that they may appreciate what's around them. Uh, and only through that deep appreciation will they see the value of, uh, you know, conservation. Uh, when it comes to research, we do have a tendency of wanting to monitor things, which is great. But, you know, quite early on in my studies, I remember one of my professors said to me, well, you can just monitor your reefs to death. You know, they're dying in front of you and you just keep monitoring them. You know, where's the impact? Where's the change? And I think this question is really important. So um, it is important that whatever it is that you're studying, whatever it is that you're researching, you're trying to inquire on what is the policy side of things. How can I change things? How can I improve things for the benefit of the future of the planet? Um, and then when you're coming up with these solutions, inclusivity as well is really important. So including your local communities, uh, including locals within your research, within your solutions and problem solving uh, so that you can have a more inclusive and sustainable future. Amazing, such a thought provoking concept to think about where we draw the line, where are the ethics, but thank you guys so much for all of your insights, and yeah, thank you all for sitting tight. Thank you.